Hi everyone, my name is Cricket Rumley and I am the director of the film festival department here at the New York Film Academy. Who is excited to be here today? Let's give it up. All right, all right. To my left, we have Mohammed Diab, my former student. Give him a round of applause for surviving oh, no. that. <laughs> No, that was the best. That was great. Like and and I like to say that I taught him everything that I know, but now I want to learn what he knows. And um, y'all know that he has gone on to make movies in Egypt. We saw Clash the other night. Who was here for Clash? All right, just give a round of applause. Thank you. That was a very very intense experience, wasn't it? Oh my gosh, we're going to talk about it a little bit. And so Clash, Amira, Cairo 678, and then this really small project you directed called Moon Knight. Has anybody heard of that? <laughs> you all are so good. You are so playing along with this. And here to my right is Isra Al-Kamali. She is a current MFA filmmaking student in the feature track. And she is going to be, she's on here, here on stage with us to ask some questions from some very unique perspectives. And we're so excited to have Mohammed and Isra and be here at NIFA. And one last thing. Hello to our Zoom audience. Hello. Thank you. I know you're all over the world. I know a lot of you sent us questions. I read every single one and really appreciate your perspectives. And I hope we get some of those answers for you today. So, Mohammed. I, <laughs> I, I feel I'm, I'm back home. Um, it's been, I was here in the class of 2005, 2000, yeah, 2005. So it's been like almost 16 years. Um, uh, this place ha holds a, a, a dear place in my heart. I see my, my teachers here. I see Sonny Calderon. <laughs> I, I, I was his first class in, in the school, so I'm, I'm so proud of that. Um, and cricket. And, and um, I'm so proud of the expansion of uh, NYFA and the, the name that it made for itself. And I was just like, I was just telling you, I had a dream yesterday. I only went to the one-year program. I was just like thinking I should go to the uh, master class. My whole dream yesterday was, was about finding my roommate, finding a place to, to go to school. How am I going to commute? Like everything about like, uh, but I was enjoying it. It wasn't, it's, I never liked school, but I, I really enjoyed my time here. I'm so glad. Yeah. You were certainly an entertaining <laughs> an, a, a student. And I love that. Um, so I'm really glad also that normally it's an anxiety dream about going back yeah. to school, but that yeah. you are excited about figuring out how to commute yeah. and finding a roommate <laughs> is awesome. Um, so. Tell us a little bit about what happened when you went back to Egypt and the early phase of your career. Um, I was just telling you, I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but um, okay. I came here and I had the syndrome of, um, I'm going to say, culturally defeated. So I was in my country, I, I, th I like a lot of uh, young generation right now, we don't watch Arabic movies. Mm -hmm. It's beneath us. We only watch uh, uh, American movies, and I never wanted to make anything Egyptian. I only wanted to make American movies. So I came here, and um, we were supposed to write a full-length script, which I think from day one I knew exactly what what's my script. I knew it exactly. Mm -hmm. So I thought it's going to be a piece of cake. And I spent the whole year, and mm -hmm. I didn't write it because I struggled with understanding the day-to-day -day Every small nuance or anything, even simple about the character, the American character that I'm writing, didn't come uh, 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 easy to me. So you were trying to write an American character, yeah. and then when you sat down to write, you were confused. You didn't yeah. know what to do. Even like my character was mm -hmm. supposed to throw the trash or anything. I don't understand him. Mm -hmm. He's not me. Mm -hmm. So I was struggling with every single thing in the script, and I never finished it. And that's when I realized... No, I, I remember, it's, it's maybe the first thing you guys mm -hmm. say in the class, but you write, write about what you know. And that wasn't just like my small experience on what did I do before uh, joining, but I felt like it's right about who I am, mm -hmm. right about my culture, understanding who you are. And um, I think that's, that's the most important lesson I want to tell you guys. There's so many, the line to making it is so long, but the line 
about your experience, who you are, your own voice, isn't that long. It's, it's, it, it, it only has you and a couple of people who, are, who has very similar experiences. Um, so I actually, uh, I, got, I, con I got convinced through the, the journey that um, I actually need to find myself in my movies and my stories. And I started digging and trying to find what's the best project that I could. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to, I started studying the international directors that made films that broke uh, the international markets. Uh, at the time, uh, definitely the film that everyone wanted to do, something like the Children of Men, for example. Right. Mm, the right. Brazilian movie, which made $12 million. And uh, uh, if I remember, I can't remember his first name, Salas, uh, the, the director, uh, I forgot the name. But um, it broke his career here in, into, mm -hmm. in, into America and stuff. And there's so many Koreans and so many uh, international directors, and I tried to, tried to study who, what they, what's their path. So I went back home. I picked a, a true story and I start pitching it. Uh, it was about a drug lord, uh, a, a real crazy Egyptian story. But he like took an island and just like make, created his own rules and completely. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a crazy <clears throat> real story about mm -hmm. someone who had a deal with the government. He's gonna help them get the terrorists, which they can't get, and they're gonna let him do whatever he do he wants on that island. Mm -hmm. So he created his own rules. It was like his own country in a way, until at the end because of love and he went crazy, it, 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 it all exploded in his face. But um, And that's a true story too. Yeah. Because of love, it all went yeah, crazy. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, that's and, a common theme. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, um, and, and I pitched it and it, it, it became a film and became the biggest franchise in Egypt. It, it became a huge thing, it became our godfather wow. in Egypt. But as a writer and very, I remember one of your, again, one of the things that you guys taught me, if you have a good script and you threw it out of the window, it's mm -hmm. going to get made. I, I can't remember. I, I, maybe, maybe you said that. You said <laughs> that? that? Okay. Like something That's your word, would right? Say. <laughs> I never forget that. I always tell that to people. And it just, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, undermining anyone's effort, uh, but uh, if you worked on a real good script, mm -hmm. chances are it's going to get made. Chances are you're going to have a chance. Uh, in making it. So I actually, in, in a very little time, and especially the competition in, in Egypt is not like LA. LA is too harsh and everyone is trying to do this. Mm -hmm. So in two or three years, I made four films. Okay, so I think this is really important because mm. you, I read that you said in an interview that someone had given you advice to go back home to Egypt. Or, that you, or did you just come away with that impression? I, I think imp the impression came from my experience writing the script and mm -hmm. it wasn't someone exactly saying that. Or maybe, I can't, I can't remember exactly what happened. But uh, all I remember is through the journey of that one year program right. here, uh, especially writing the script, uh -huh. especially understanding and definitely living in LA and seeing how fierce is the competition and how mm -hmm. hard it is. Uh, I didn't give up on the competition. I, I would, if, if I didn't have any other path, but I knew I can make it there and make my own path and make my own voice. And then one day, I remember someone else said something very important. I never forgot that. If you want Hollywood, Hollywood mm -hmm. is gonna treat you very harshly. <laughs> but if Hollywood <laughs> wants you, you're gonna be treated like a king. They will open the doors. Yes. Yes. So. I feel like that happened yeah. for you. In a way, but it, it, that that path is not. It didn't take a year or right. take more than ten years. But uh, but I want to tell you, I, I didn't go there thinking every day I want to come back. Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm making films that are close to my heart. I'm expressing myself. It doesn't matter where. What I really learned is, I just like you need to express yourself. Yeah. At, and, and today, even like after doing Moon Knight, I still want to make Egyptian movies. I, that's that's what I learned through the process. That it's not about big or small. It's about how, what stories are gonna you're going to uh, uh, um, make that are going to express who you are. Well, this is really interesting because Isra and I had mm. several conversations in preparing for this. And, and one of the things that we talked about was the concept of voice. And yeah. my question was, um, we always talk about how important that is and how would you describe your voice and how did you find it? And then Isra has a follow-up to that in a minute. <laughs> Sure. Okay. Um, I think you have to have something to say in life. 
I, I, mm-hmm. I'm, I get, by the way, I'm a bit politically active and I was just like... Just I, a little bit. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> no, I was actually too politically active. But uh, even though I'm not, um, I'm not making any political movies right now, it's not just about poli- mm-hmm. politics, but I think you have mm-hmm. an, an opinion. Having an opinion, I hope I hope you're not a flat earther, so don't have that opinion on the film. <laughs> but uh, but uh, having an opinion and and yeah. feeling uh, uh, strong about something. Uh, by the way, I, I was just telling you, I always try to couple any film that I make with something bigger than the film. Mm-hmm. Um, so in what class, what does that mean? It means even like in Moonlight. Uh huh. It's a more of a film. It's right. it's supposed to be something like uh, entertaining. But uh, no, it, we, we made it into, uh, at least in our hearts, the main story is about uh, uh, mental health. Yes, and, it is. And uh, um, sharing this with the world, mm-hmm. explaining DID to people. By the way, I, uh, multiple personality disorder, we saw it in so many movies. 99% of the time you saw it, it's portrayed wrong. And I learned that through the process of searching uh, mm-hmm. for uh, DID. And I think Moon Knight is one of the few uh, uh, depictions of DID, dissociative identity disorder, mm-hmm. that actually uh, uh, the community of the DID felt, okay, this actually presents us, right. and, and mm-hmm. it's and it's real. And we try to use the plot to help that. The idea, why would someone? When is the crack in the the brain, or not mm-hmm. the brain, the, the identity that created the other identities, learning that actually it's um, it's it's a mask. You create the other character to mask yourself and protect yourself from the trauma mm-hmm. that you went through. All those things I didn't know about, and making sure that people, if you saw like Marvel, in in the last Spider-Man, every single character has another character. Every villain mm-hmm. is two characters. Every single villain is another character. In a way, it's the idea. In a way, right, right. Mm. But it's always like the 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 the. the the way the depiction in Hollywood, it's always anyone who has DID has a, 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 another character as evil. Mm-hmm. So in a way, we didn't want to do that in Moonlight to make sure that people are not stigmatized and 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 and, uh, and no, you can have multiple personalities and every one of them is different, but it doesn't have to be evil. That's a small thing. But again, coupling your idea with something close to your heart that you feel okay, I'm I'm representing something. I'm changing the world, even in a in, in a small area. To me. Clash had that, 678 had that. Mm-hmm. By the way, a film about love has that. A film, a, right. a simple story about love, but just like feeling the, the weight of what you're doing that is more than entertainment. Even if you're making a comedy, you can tell yourself, by the way, comedy got us through pa- the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> like, I, That's I, the I, truth. I, to me, like watching something like Seinfeld or something like whatever makes you Shit's happy. Creek. Yeah. Uh, twice. I watch yeah. every episode at least yeah. twice. <laughs> yeah. So it's maybe in your mentality, maybe mm-hmm. in your brain, but I just like always tell myself I'm doing something bigger than just like entertainment. Mm-hmm. And it makes me get more strength, uh, mm-hmm. push myself more. Um, and and I, I get more energy and, and, and I do more. Yeah, I think that what is so also interesting about Moon Knight is it's in this huge world that is so much happening in, in it. But there are so many intimate personal stories mm-hmm. that happen in moments of subtleness or silence and quietness, whether it's between you know the villain and the hero or like um, between the other characters, which I think was very beautiful. And I think also that's um, you know a unique voice. And I also wanted to ask: um, one can lose their voice um, in a huge project like this one. How do you make sure that you don't lose your voice and your style? You fight every day. <laughs> every day. For two years. Every day. <laughs> um, but I, I want to tell you something. Uh, Marvel is a big machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think just like the world is changing, Marvel is changing. And I actually I think they're leading the change in a way. They, they are opening doors for representation. Uh, but they picked me for a reason. <clears throat> my, my films have my voice. Uh, and again, the last thing I'm going to say about a voice, live, live life. You have, to have, you have to have a character, you have to live life, you have to be a person to have a voice. From day one, I was just like, okay, you like me for that, for the films that I made, and this is my voice, this is my character. I'm going to try to bring it every single day. Mm-hmm. You just like need to learn, um, if you're making an independent film uh, in America or anywhere in the world, as a director, you're the boss. You can do whatever you want. I actually... Like, uh, no one question. I can cancel a scene, I can do whatever you want, my, what I want, any day. Right, right. Any day, right, re, right, re, right, change. To, you know what, guys, that sequence is canceled. I do that, mm-hmm. whatever I want. If you're, 
as big as you get when you're working with a studio, it means you're giving some, or sometimes the majority or some of your power. Mm -hmm. And you become a, a, a seat at the table. And if you're not well, you, have, you just like need to understand if you are one of the characters who can do that or not. A lot of people didn't work with, couldn't work with Marvel. Eva DuVernay uh, was supposed to do uh, Black Panther. She, mm -hmm. she quit, she couldn't. Like she wanted to be more in, more, uh, more in control. Uh, Edgar Wright was doing Ant-Man for nine years and eventually he left. Uh, and and uh, he left because he has a very unique style and they wanted it to be a Marvel film. Mm -hmm. um, Still, I, I'm just saying you need to, if you want to make big studio movies, you have to know how to navigate. I still, I don't think I, I, I gave up my integrity. I fought every day with a smile on my face. Um, uh, it, was, it was very hard for me making, I made three movies as a director and I was completely the boss. And mm -hmm. um, I just, I, I think I, I, I achieved at least 70 to 80 percent of what I wanted to put, which is an achievement. And a lot of people see Moon Knight and say it's different than most of the uh, Marvel uh, f uh, shows, which is something I'm proud of. It's very hard to push Marvel to go uh, an extra mile, especially yeah. if you're that successful. I think that there's something that our students and our audience who are emerging filmmakers or new filmmakers should take away from this, and that is that like, when you do get to the bigger levels, it, you have to have diplomacy skills. Absolutely. You have to know how to, to not just fight, but how do you fight? What's the difference between fighting on your independent film Absolutely. and fighting at the studio? I think you, you rephrase it much better than, I, than I, the way I said it. When I say fight, it's diplomacy. It's never, mm -hmm. we never had an, a heated argument, not even once, because I was making sure, and they were making sure, they're the nicest people on earth. Marvel. I love hearing that. They're the nicest people on Isn't earth. Isn't that great? <laughs> like we never had a heated conversation, even though there was underneath. Everyone wants to like let's let's move here, let's move there. So there was always a, a, a very nice way of discussion or discussing stuff, uh, and you have to be convincing. I remember I making my first film. I, I just like we skipped a part at the beginning. I wrote four films in Egypt, and I that's when I discovered okay, those four films are commercially successful, but they're not my voice. Yeah, okay, talk about that. What happened? It's, it's just, a, it's very simple. If I told you a, a joke, uh -huh. and you went and tell, told anyone your, the joke, you're gonna put your own taste on it. Yes. Everyone, your imagination of that guy that we're talking about in the joke, you're gonna see him tall, I'm gonna see him uh, uh, short. You, everyone mm -hmm. sees a person differently. So when you give a director uh, your project, he sees it his own way. So it wasn't my voice. I'm not saying they're bad or good. It wasn't my voice. Mm -hmm. So that's the first time I realized I need to be a director. I mm -hmm. never had the dream of being a director, by the way. But I discovered, no, that's not how I saw the film in my head. And I write visually. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'm going to be a novelist or I'm going to direct my next movie. And I became successful enough to have a script and people saying, okay, we want the script. Mm -hmm. And I told them, mm -hmm. okay, the only way to have that script is I'm going to direct it. <laughs> uh, and then what happened? Some people liked it, some people didn't. <laughs> okay. Some people offered me more money to buy the script, 6, 7, 8 it was. Uh -huh. for, to get the best, the most famous director at the time to, to direct it, but I said no, and I didn't get paid. Mm. I, I got paid as a, as a writer, uh -huh. I got zero, I really got zero money for directing that film. So you had to prove yourself on that film. That was your, your payment was yes. the opportunity Absolutely. to direct the film. Absolutely. And gotcha. I got paid zero and I'm, I'm so happy that that happened. Uh, and I proved, I, 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 I geeked, just like started, uh, I, I uh, studied directing on my own. Watched movies, watched uh, commentary. Uh, I bought a course online. Hollywood ca uh, camera work. Um, I um, I read a couple of books, great books about directing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. visual story. That's that's a that's a, a book I remember. Not just one book. You have to like open your doors, um, and then I try to watch the movies that I wrote and turn into movies. And how? Mm -hmm. By the way, I knew nothing about directing. My experience in in as a film uh, as a um, writer, I never went to to. to uh, to the location or anything. So I knew nothing. 
And I was just telling you, I went the first day of shooting, and it's just like, like very excited. Okay, let's go. Let's move. And they're just like, what? No, it's, you have to say action. Okay. <laughs> and I said action. This actually happened. Uh, just stop, stop. Everyone's just like, my sister, stop. You have to say uh, roll camera first. Roll camera, action. You have to say roll sound, roll camera, action. And I said it. Uh, but this actually happened. I didn't know anything. But, um, but I, I knew the advanced stuff. I knew uh, uh, what I wanted. I knew, how, like, those things I, I picked up in a week. In a week, everyone was telling me, okay, now you know inside out those small, simple things that everyone knows. But uh, how I want the character directing the actors. Um, there is a, a great book called Directing Actors. Um, Judith Weston? I, for, I don't I know the names, so. but I read it like a hundred times. I love that <laughs> book. But I mean, picking those small things is super simple. The most, one of the most important uh, uh, notes that I would give you about directing is don't care about the location. A lot of people get insecure and they want to prove that I know everything, that um, hmm. uh, I need to prove myself to the, uh, uh, everyone there. You don't. Who, who cares? The, as long as the good, you know that you got something nice on the camera, it doesn't matter. I'm someone who, go, until today, even in the Marvel, and I'm coming from Egypt and people, I know that people are questioning me in their minds. I go, the first thing I do the first day, guys, you know this department or green screen, I know nothing about it. You all know more about me. Can you please explain? I'm not shy to tell everyone that I don't know anything, that I don't. Okay, so we're jumping all over the questions at <laughs> this sorry, point. I'm sorry, I apologize. No, 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 this is great because one of the questions I had was how do you go from making essentially low budget, gritty dramas to a Marvel piece that is five hours of story yeah. and green screen and special effects and like what, what was your process in learning how to make that kind of work? I'm gonna try to answer this question, but I'm gonna try to pick up uh, something very important. Mm -hmm. I discovered through 678, which my first film, I, I decided I'm gonna direct it the simplest way. I mean, it's gonna be a slice of life. The only thing in mind that is gonna tell me this is right or wrong is, what I have on the screen, does it match life or not? Is mm -hmm. the actor, is this, the moment that we create uh, magic is the moment that I feel, okay, this is a slice of life. Mm -hmm. That thing fell naturally. Uh, her hair, everything looked natural. But I discovered, so I directed it the simplest way in my mind. But the most important thing, what I discovered, and then I discovered in the Marvel show that my strength, that I am a good screenwriter. If you're a good screenwriter, I I've, been, I've been offered hundreds and hundreds of Hollywood projects since 2016 with Clash. Mm -hmm. That's when I had an agent and that's what I... Ironically, what I discovered is no one gets a good script. Never. You always get an okay script or a bad script, and you have to make them better. And Interesting. That's, and that's, if you saw someone like Denis Villeneuve, all the films that he made, I, I, because I'm, I'm a professional, I can tell you that they were an okay script or a good script. He made them into a brilliant script because he's such a great uh, director that can evolve a story. So... In, in six, seven, eight, that's what happened. And then jumping to something uh, uh, like Moon Knight. What I discovered later on, because I always geek when I just like, uh, uh, when, I, when I go to something, uh, I try to understand what's going on. So when I started applying for Marvel, I discovered that actually they do this a lot. Uh -huh. They get directors who just directed a $3 million movie, a $5 million movie, a $2 million movie that knows drama. Interesting. 90% of their directors are like that. Mm -hmm. The guy, um, John Watts, the guy who directed Spider-Man. He only mm -hmm. directed before it's a film called uh, uh, Cop Car, mm -hmm. a three million dollar movie. It's just like about teenagers. So okay, the guy who did something uh, meaningful about a teenager can direct right. Spider-Man. Right. All the spectacle and all, you ha we have so many people that can help you. It doesn't mean that you can't have your own uh, uh, print on it. Mm -hmm. And you can be very unique, but if you don't want to be unique, there's people to help you with the action, with the green screen, with everything. Mm -hmm. I try to be unique. John Watts try to be unique, and I think he even gets better. Like the last Spider-Man is better than the, 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 the previous two when, when it comes to action and stuff. But um, what I mean is that it's something that they know. No one ever in Marvel ever mm -hmm. asked me, okay, 
we have to figure out how are you going to direct action or green screen. That's not even a part of a conversation. It's they have a system. You have someone beside you. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's it's and all the big action sequences you direct them beforehand. Mm -hmm. You direct them. Um, you draw them, and then you previs them. You make them into cartoon, and you see them, and you direct them, direct them like a hundred times. Uh huh. And everyone approves those scenes, and you go just like makes those make those scenes exactly the way you made them before. So there's no right. risk with with the big big uh, action. Uh huh. The real challenge, even in Moon Knight, was how to evolve the script. Aha. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. How to evolve the script, and um, I was just telling you about Marvel's way, and no one on earth does this except Marvel. Marvel's way <laughs> is. It's a big machine, and uh, their way is we have a script, we have a time to shoot. We're going to shoot whether the script is ready or not. The thing is, Marvel is so successful that they don't care. Usually, you're going to spend a spend dollar in any film, and it's going to make $2 or $3. No, no, no. Marvel make the dollar brings $100. So what's the problem of spending $2? They are printing money. They're so successful. They're so good at, at what they're doing. So they shoot what they have ready, but the additional photography, the reshoots are massive. So something like... Um, you said like 50 days for yes. a show Let's is Let's common. say a film is 80 days of reshoot, and I'm, I'm actually using real examples. A film that is 80 days of shooting, mm -hmm. it gets 50 days of reshoots. Some of the TV shows that you saw, the, the Marvel Plus, are like 100 days of shoots and 50 days of reshoots. That's, that's very, very normal. The good thing is you know that you have a safety net. What, whatever you have, Marvel is never, ever going to give up on you, and it's always going to evolve the script as much as you can. You don't know how many projects that got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, and they were, everyone was speaking inside that this show is bad. <laughs> but uh, but uh, they keep fixing it, and you have to give them credit. Yeah. They never give up on a project. They know how to fix it at the end. Uh -huh. Their weird way that needs a lot of money is working for them. They're always <laughs> successful in that. Um, on that topic, like, did you ever feel intimidated if you had that safety net? Was I, there at one point you felt intimidated, and what did you do? I was, I want to give, in my, in my mind, I feel as a film director, you are giving every day everything you have. You are sweat and blood to every scene. Mm -hmm. So thinking that this scene, is scene might be on the floor is something hard. Also kind yeah. of like, as somebody who saves money yeah. and is frugal, <laughs> it hurts me to hear this. Yeah. As well, someone who's trying to fund my first feature on an ultra low budget, yeah. know, it, hurts. it hurts. But it, again, they are the most successful financially in the world. It's yeah. again, I don't want anyone in the world to try this, and I don't think any company is brave enough to do this. Uh -huh. And the right way definitely is fix a script before you go in. And <laughs> absolutely. And by the way, I, I couldn't, like the moment I signed, we had a deadline of shooting. So I, every, we're preparing what we have. So I had to try to convince them, please let me write a draft. And they were, some of the people who inside, they were fighting it because mm -hmm. if I try to write a draft, I'm going to, ruin all the preparation for everything right, that is going right. on. And you need to prepare for two, the real amount of time that we need to prepare for six hours of film, because this is not TV in a way. Mm -hmm. It's like two years. Of course. So we only had eight months. Yeah. So, but still, me and my wife, who was a producer in the show, we, Oscar Isaac and Ethan Hawke, uh, part of their them signing was just like, Muhammad and Sarah need to write a draft. Of each episode or oh, the everything. pilot? Of the whole thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, like, yeah, six episodes, and, and we had to deliver them in two months. Can we give hard. him a round of applause okay. for that? I, I, I just want to <laughs> say something, because I never want to take from anyone's credit. Credit. We had great writers, and after our draft, it, it was written, like, another 20, 30 times. That's yeah. So, I'm not taking credit for it, but I'm saying uh -huh. we started something that definitely helped make the script, script more ready, and mm -hmm. I think from the pitch that I pitched Oscar and Ethan, it was very important to feel that that pitch is there on the on the yeah. page because I pitched them something that is wasn't on the page. So um, we did that, and I think the good news, uh, another thing that helped the script is that for the first time in, in, in Marvel, mm -hmm. um, they decided because we wanted to make, all of us, and I had Oscar and Ethan, and Oscar and Ethan and our people 
who are not just like who came uh, in, in a Marvel show to do a Marvel show and, and big spec. They wanted the roles to be important and the show to succeed right. and to be different. So uh, we created this thing that uh, we stay together and read every single line and every single uh, sentence in the whole script. And all of us, the writers, mm -hmm. the producers, Oscar, Ethan, May, mm -hmm. me and Sarah, we all talk, read every single line and discuss it and change it. So, and that was very hard because we didn't have time, but we did that and that changed the script into something even evolved it even more. And because of that, we have the least amount of reshoots in the history of Marvel. Four days. Four days. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, this is such a, you know, love song to screenwriting exactly. right now. I'm just going to revel in <laughs> it for a second. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Okay, in a few minutes, we're going to ask people to line up if you have questions. Um, I know we have 10,000 questions, but uh, while we're still on Moon Knight, Isra had some observations about the music. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I think this is something that was so magical about Moon Knight is um, hearing the Egyptian songs in Moon Knight, whether it was the Warda song or the more modern ones, it went viral, especially like on TikTok, on Instagram. I told you, I, I watched the, the Marvel logo with the Warda song like 10 times. Um, there was just something really magical about singing an Arabic song. Can going I just on say like, something for the audience yeah. really quickly? So if you've seen Moon Knight, there's a different song that plays over the opening credit sequence at the beginning, and she's re referencing a really specific yeah. Arabic song yes. that was popular at what time? It was. It, it's a song that we all grew up mm -hmm. listening to, my parents' generations, my generation, and it's by one of the most famous um, uh, singers in the Arabic-speaking countries in the Middle East. So it was such a surreal moment to, you know, see that like we can hear that Arabic words on the Marvel logo. And I wanted to ask like how was your process of choosing music, especially that some of them were what we would consider classical and others were a little more modern? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm going to say something. I work with my wife. She's my producer. I wouldn't recommend that, by the way. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, I, have, I have friends who didn't survive that. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, Sarah is the one is the musical person in the house. Mm. She is mm -hmm. Egyptian American, so she knows what's from our gold mine of music in the Arab world. Mm. What could appeal to the West? Mm. So Sarah picked every song. And definitely every song is screened by Marvel because they want to feel, okay, this could uh, 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 appeal to the West. But uh, uh, as you said, it went viral. Like, I want to tell you that people were talking about the song sometimes even more than the episode itself. <laughs> that this song on a Marvel logo, it doesn't make sense. But I, I, I see this as like a first full circle for me from someone mm -hmm. who started telling you I, was, I came here thinking I, I, I want nothing to do with Egypt and my culture. Mm -hmm. To actually making sure that um, that my first Hollywood produ uh, uh, production, um, it's 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 Western, but mm -hmm. in the same time it has my voice and it has my culture, mm -hmm. and you don't know how Egyptians and the Arab world, as mm -hmm. you as you were saying, Isra, uh, deal with the uh, Moon Knight. seeing Egypt for the first time as a normal country, not just the desert. Uh, having an Egyptian superhero. <laughs> oh, e Egypt is such a big urban city. It's as big as LA. Yeah. And it's always uh, just like portrayed very exotic. And, and it's mm -hmm. so seeing it just like a normal place and having an Egyptian superhero, uh, having Egyptian music, and all of a sudden, so the young generation, okay, our music is cool. They're just like, what? Is it cool? <laughs> because they, they saw that around the world people like, one of the songs became number two on the charts in the world. So, so uh, uh, that that full circle for me was very important to 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 to, to feel like okay, I'm representing mm -hmm. who I am, and actually that that became something that I want to do in my next projects. Mm -hmm. I want to make American films or films are for the West and the world mm -hmm. for sure, but about a character that is uh, 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 about someone like me, uh, um, an Arab or something, or someone is going through something like myself, uh, my experience coming here, whatever, like, but something right. about me, writing about my, what I know, writing about mm -hmm. my experience or coming here and seeing how Egyptians and Ar the Arab world for the first time having this pride 
uh, that uh, an Egyptian guy did that, or it wasn't only an Egyptian guy, by the way, I, in Marble, I brought a lot of Egyptian talent. Yes, you mm, did. Yeah. Yeah, it was very important for me that, um, okay, I got an opportunity, but I know I'm not the only one who's good. I know there's so many people. Mm -hmm. So I picked a couple of people, and Marble was hesitant in the beginning, but after the show, when one of them is the... The, the Hisham Nazi, the, the guy who made the music, who became mm -hmm. uh, uh, Emmy nominated uh, afterwards. Yes. I think the, the music in the show is very unique. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them is the editor and other people. But I mean, Marvel told me, Kevin Feige himself mm -hmm. told me, I love those people and we have to work with them again. He, he, and then a friend of mine, the guy who's going to direct Blade, he called me and told me, Muhammad, thank you for bringing your people and fighting for them <laughs> uh, because now I can bring my own crew. I can. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So Marvel usually give you like uh, people who are approved by them, make it, like people who work with them or something. And they're mm -hmm. flexible. They just like suggest people they know yeah. and stuff like that. But um, when I told them I want those people or stuff, like they just like went and asked and took some time, but uh, mm -hmm. they came and said yes. But uh, now they, they're more brave to, to try people from different worlds because everyone has his own again everyone has his own voice if you have a different experience you probably have, have your own voice have your own experience have your own sound um, and I think that's why Hisham, Hisham's music the guy who made the music is, is different and unique yeah and I think that like also what is must have been a challenge is there has already been a lot of portrayals of Egypt mm -hmm. in Hollywood so it's not like you know they haven't seen Egypt before so you're coming into materials that you have to, you know, improve and improve the image. You know, yeah. if you can if you can talk about that, you know, have that existing negative portrayal yeah. of Egypt and having to enter and I, I, I had to go a bit aggressive and I, I criticized a couple of the projects that are portraying Egypt in this day and age in the same way that yes. it was portrayed. Mm. I never wanted to go aggressive or anything. I was just like but it, that's the frustration that mm -hmm. everyone in Egypt sees. Like uh, when, when we see a couple of movies, I'm not going to name movies, but uh, you still see us as desert. You still see you us. You can Google it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another time I was upset. Mm. Again, I'm not going to name the movie, but a comic book that is huge and it's made about an Egyptian character. And you're making it in this day and just like excluding all the Egyptian part of it. And there's no why. It's the time that... Any chance for representation is important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just like, again, uh, uh, the, our uh, superhero, Layla, having curly hair. Mm -hmm. That's something that made a difference for my daughter, who's like 10. Growing mm -hmm. up, she always, I had to take her to Disneyland. She always wanted to straighten her hair, even like when she was three, because she didn't see anyone. I, can you believe it? Wow. No one in our family or anyone ever told her anything, but she always sees the princesses. Uh -huh. All of them yep. look different than her. Yeah. So at the time, I think Hollywood is, is, is catching up and things are getting better, but uh, having people, uh, uh, representation is important. Uh, and mm -hmm. really seeing us in it, especially, we are uh, among the minorities, not the only minority, but among the minorities that are always seen in a negative light. So. Mm -hmm. Seeing us positive is something, I'm not going to say it could save life, but I'm sure the guy who killed people in the mosque in, in New Zealand never saw a positive uh, character in his life in TV or in life, maybe even met him. So um, that's why it's very important. It, it is very important. And I just I want to say from a screenwriting point of view, there's a technique that you can use, which is to start out by making a list of all of the stereotypes and cliches. Just yeah. go ahead and put it on a piece of paper and say, these are all the stereotypes, these are all the cliches, know what they are, own them, and then start to look for ways around it. And, and I think that, you know, when you're working from a real place of wanting to just build characters, like I think that that's part of your authenticity is that you were just committed to the characters. And also I want to say something about Layla when she turns into a superhero. <laughs> I love her outfit, first of all. I love it. Love her outfit. It's beautiful. I might go as that for Halloween. <laughs> but I was stunned by her hair. It was like, because most of the superheroes always have something on their head, yeah, yeah, right? Like yeah. Wonder Woman. and But she's got this amazing hair, and yeah. it's just like part of her superpower. Yeah. And that yeah. was really, really beautiful. I want to tell you something. Growing up, and things are changing right now, but growing up, 
-hmm. having curly hair. I I have friends for 20 years, and I didn't know that their hair was cur hair is curly. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah, girls growing up now it's becoming a bit cool. Okay. But growing up, curly hair is bad. You had to straighten your hair. Mm -hmm. They, it has a bad name. Like there is a word for curly hair, and, yeah. and, and if you said it, it just like means something bad. So again, it's culturally culturally defeated. India and Egypt and those kind of countries. One of the most uh, 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 popular products are uh, uh, um, whitening your hair, your your skin. Yeah, it, you're culturally defeated, and and we need to change that. But by, by showing normal people who look different in a positive light, to to definitely change the misconceptions here, but in the same time to make empower people there. Yeah. Right. So um, right. again, I'm learning that. I'm, yeah. I'm not saying, because yeah. sometimes it's a theory, mm -hmm. but when it happened with Moon Knight and I saw the effect, I saw how Egyptians like dealt with, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Layla and uh, seeing Egypt and the music and it, I, I really, I, I, I'm absolutely sold on the idea of representation and its importance. You're the ambassador. <laughs> Not that much. I got lucky that I, and I'm proud that I'm someone who uh, uh, got the first chance to do something like that. But uh, there's so much talent, more than me, definitely in the Middle East and around the world, that just like need um, a chance to prove themselves. I, I would say the same thing uh, uh, with African Americans in, 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 in Hollywood mm -hmm. now. You saw once they got a chance five, six years later, they're making great stuff. Making everything like, that out is out this fall. Is, yeah. that's interesting to me is yeah. by an African American. Absolutely, filmmaker. I love yeah. what they're doing and beautiful. So I think uh, Hollywood is changing, and in in in, th I'm happy that we're here in in this time. So um, if anybody has a question, you please go ahead and start lining up. I'm going to ask Mohammed one more question while people are doing that. Mohammed, when we were in the back, you were talking about. Oh my gosh, it's a mob. <laughs> uh, my, my pleasure. I'm going to answer every question. <laughs> He's going to answer every, every question. Every question. Yeah. Absolutely. So, when we were in the back, you were talking about how you always have a mind towards um, a, an Egyptian audience and a Western audience when writing yeah. scenes and revealing exposition. Can you talk about why? I was. We were talking about Clash, mm -hmm. and how Clash is so domestic. But if you went too domestic, you lose the. the you have to understand why you were making a film. Who are you making the film to? Mm -hmm. So, to me, to make something global, it has to be domestic, but at the same time, it has to be universal. Who cares about why they're fighting? Two sides fighting. That's the most important thing. In America, you can identify to that. In Venezuela, you can identify that that. If you have a, a fight in your village, a fight in your uh, uh, family, you can identify to that. Two people fighting and realizing their humanity. That's the most important thing. So that's why we don't get into the weeds of what's going on. You'll get the hang of it. Um, in Cairo 678, it's about sexual harassment. Again, it is about people at the end. And you need to, if you, if you just felt this is very Egyptian, mm -hmm. you're not going to connect to it. Okay, it's a story about Egypt. See you later. But if you felt, okay, I, I can... This could happen in, in my work, this could happen in my street, this could happen right. to me. That's when you get a universal film. So it's very important to find uh, the middle ground between this and that. Uh, mm -hmm. I would definitely push you and, and encourage you to do something local, but just like don't go into the extreme details that makes it such a, 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 a not universal story. We need more of the human connection and the human Absolutely. conflict than we do all the details. You, that's why you you talk to me. That's why you can always <laughs> say what I want to say better. Yes, absolutely. It all comes down definitely to the drama of the real people and and and, and the the human connection. Absolutely. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. All right. Well, Take it away. Good morning, Mohammed. Thank you so much for coming to speak with speak with us today. Thank you. Uh, my name is Luis Alexander Mejia. I'm an alumni of the Acting for Film program here, and I wanted to first of all commend you on all the work that you've done, that Thank big you. headway that you've done in the entertainment industry by making sure that you fight for your voice, and but you're also representing your own people. And so uh, I commend you on that. And so I understand that very well because in my in a previous life, I, I went to Berkeley. I am a Latino first generation immigrant here from El Salvador. And I saw how hard it is for my family and for people like us to make any type of contribution here and how difficult the opportunities are. And then when I went into investment banking and I saw how we're very well represented we were, and I stepped back and I looked at the, uh, 
I looked at Vanity Fair and I saw how the cover of the Vanity Fair for the Oscar nominees were always very, very sparsely represented by different uh, ethnicities. And so even though that's, there's, some, there's some progress in that, we still have a lot more work to do. Absolutely. So, so, so tell uh, us what your question yeah, is that today. Was my, that, that was exactly what my question was now. So my question then is, uh, what is Marvel doing uh, to ensuring that other ethnicities are very well represented in the future films and creating characters for those films. Mm -hmm. uh, that for me is, a, is really important as a, as a Latino uh, immigrant and actor. So. Uh, I commend your experience. And by the way, I worked in banking, by the way, before. before. Awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's a sign you're going to make. I remember it. that. <laughs> yes. yes, I yes. Used to work before, before I went to study. I want to tell you something. It's very important. I am not Marvel. I, yes. I, like uh, when we are working on a project, there is no discussion about other projects. Like you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you my opinion from what I'm seeing, just like you. So right. I'm, I'm not an expert when it comes to Marvel, but I see them. Like I remember, we, our show was followed by Miss Marvel, which was, by the way, it was review bombed because a lot of people were just like a shock, of a Muslim, superhero that prays and just like, so wow. I. See, yeah, it was it yeah. was it was it was a new thing, but I think that's how we do it. You 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 do something daring and 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 um, break the stereotype. Mm -hmm. And I feel uh, I, I'm not following exactly what characters that they're doing right now, but I feel that this is something that they're definitely ahead of DC. If mm -hmm. you compare them to DC, mm -hmm. right? I'm sorry, like there's I don't see as much uh, uh, representation in DC as 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 Marvel. Uh, Interesting. Uh, but I, I'm not, a, I, I want to tell you something again funny. I wouldn't call myself uh, um, um, a comic book uh, a geek, but I, anything that I do, I geek in. So uh, uh, I don't even know how to use the verb, but. Uh, but uh, <laughs> You're doing great. I'm doing great, okay. <laughs> so I love comic book movies, but just like a spec normal spectator. But once I, um, I started applying for the job, I like had a I made a PhD watching every <laughs> single film, understanding what's going on, and understanding the drama of it. Mm -hmm. So all I can tell you is I have the feeling that Marvel is on the right track and they're expanding as much as they can and they're focused on representation as much as they can, more than DC, which I hope they do more because I actually love how DC work when they give their uh, talents more freedom to go crazy and do whatever they want and that's why they have more hits and misses because they're not like Marvel. Marvel prints and know exactly what they want to do. DC doesn't know what they want to do. They get the talent and they give them trust. Sometimes it pays off and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But um, definitely have to commend Marvel on risking and giving, uh, right. uh, 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 like let's say uh, uh, with Moon Knight, with Miss Marvel, with the Black Panther, with the Shang-Chi, all those are like huge uh, representation cards that they, that they really, uh, uh, stood by and and I'm sure I see from their strategy again just like you that they're gonna they're gonna try to uh, uh, make everyone represented uh, for Latinos I'm happy that Endor is out with the um, Diego Luna as, mm -hmm. as the star that's a huge thing so uh, and Oscar Isaac even though he wasn't playing Latino in our uh, show but I'm sure other uh, and other and other uh, uh, they're, they're going to cover everything. That's At least that's my what I'm thinking of. Right, right. Risk and reward. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Oh, this is too tall. Uh, well, guys, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, thank you, Nefa, for doing this. And thank you, Mohammed, for the inspiration. Really, it uh, means a lot, a lot, a lot to every one of us. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Zeke Abe. <laughs> uh, so uh, my name is Kevin Keegan, and I'm a faculty in, at NIFA. I'm a picture editor. But however, I'm, I'm emphasizing more on screenwriting and directing lately. Now, I have many questions, but I'm going to make it very simple. Okay. Now, two things when I watched the, 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 moon, uh, the moon Knight episode, uh, two things that kind of got my attention. First, the Armenian genocide. I'm Armenian-American. And the second one, but when I speak. Yeah. It took me back when I was 16 years old, when I was dancing with my... Uh, crush. Um, so the question is, when it comes to uh, issues like, you know, Armenian genocide or the political issues, oh. who, made, who, who make the decisions? You or the executives or who, who kind of influences you to bring it in the, in the, in the episode? In, in Marvel because it's, uh, and Disney, it's like a country. 
you have to be very diplomatic. You don't want to piss anyone. This, I think, if you ask me, this slipped. It wasn't, this slipped. No one meant to, to, to be politically active in that sentence. You know what I mean? Okay. No one even thought that this is going to be politically active. I'm just being honest with you. I'm not saying, uh, uh, siding with anything. I'm just telling you the way the Disney, Marvel machine mm -hmm. work. If they want to be political, they're going to be political. If they, like, they're siding right now with any uh, um, issue, then they're going to stand by it. And they're going to, it, it's going to be known. You know what I mean? Yes. But sometimes... Some stuff slip. But if you ask me, how, what's the system? Every single sentence that you write is reviewed by people mm -hmm. uh, who are actually, like, in, especially in our show. We had a rabbi. We had a, a Muslim uh, person uh, uh, read every single line. Mm -hmm. We had uh, um, an entity called Sila, just to make sure that the Sila is, is making sure that the culture uh, uh, is represented right in, in every culture. And we had... Uh, Jewish culture and we had uh, Muslim culture in the in the show or Arab culture mm -hmm. so their job is to read every single thing and give you their uh, assessment this is going to be problematic or not mm -hmm. and definitely if Marvel thinks sometimes you know what it's fine we can take that problem or not but I can tell you that this about the Armenian genocide it, no one uh, said it's it's anything and we never had a discussion inside uh, be, before or after about it mm -hmm. you know what I mean um, and the other question about but when is big? Yes, I still don't understand uh, the, the connection. connection. <laughs> yeah, but when is big? It, the word means um, I'm fond of you. I'm fond of you, and I feel comfort in you. You give me you 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 are my companion in a way. But when is big? I need someone to have an, an So you're my companion. Mm -hmm. The song is in the beginning of episode three, where for the first time Mark and Stephen are embarking on a, tr uh, a journey together. It's the first time in the show that they actually know and aware, are aware of their, uh, each other's mm -hmm. existence. So in a way, but when is big, it's the two of them embarking on a journey together. It's a metaphor of that. Okay. Uh, but again, any song, you have credit to Sara. She's the one who picked every song. <laughs> She's the one who came up with the idea of, of behind every song. And when she sent me that song on the Marvel logo, I just like, wow. I knew that people are going to, this nice. is going to go viral and people are going to love it. Nice. And by the way, I wasn't going to watch The Moonlight uh, if it wasn't for my kids. They're like fanatics. And by the way, they wanted to come today, but, you know, they had this COVID thing, so really? that's why they couldn't come. Yeah. Please, please give them yes. my regards, please. Yeah, we'll do it. And by the way, one suggestion on season two, probably you want to add some uh, Egyptian food, ta'amiya. <laughs> <laughs> Thank we, you. We will, promise. Yeah. Thank you. I promise, inshallah. Thank you. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Ruben Abdurrahman. I'm a screenwriter and filmmaker. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you of like your loyalty to the school that you've been in. It really t shows that you're decent. Um, the second thing that. is that um, I was wondering, like, you had like a really inspir inspirational story, like for making independent films into blockbuster like TV series. So. What advice do you have, like from 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 Arabic point of view or any parts of the world, for those who've done like feature films, and they want to like, is it like show it in festivals or or distribute it in cinemas? What advice do you have on that? Uh, my my advice would be try your best to make something uh, that 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 expresses you, that something that touches people. It doesn't matter if you shot it with a phone. I honestly don't think there's any excuse these days. You have, you have no excuses. With a phone, you can make a film that go to festivals. Because in festivals, and I was a jury in Cannes. Oh, nice. I, do you really think we are going to say in, 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 a, in a film that we're watching, and we say, okay, the colors are bad? Mm -mm. or the No one ever says that. It's story. It's story. Story. Mm -hmm. Story. So I've seen bad looking films in mm -hmm. huge festivals. Mm -hmm. okay. So focus on the story and make something touching. Yeah. And try and fail. Make short films. Make... Uh, features, make whatever. And I want to tell you something. Clash, the whole film is inside the police truck. Oh, yeah. That's not true. I told everybody that, but then there are these long, deep scenes and of all sorts of stuff going yeah. on. Yeah, but I want to tell you what's, what's, what's going on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First of all, I didn't talk about this today, but because I was involved in the Egyptian revolution, I became blacklisted. Oh. So I knew that there's a chance I couldn't make Clash. And actually, after Clash, I couldn't work in Egypt, and that's why I left and came here. Okay. But making Clash, I knew that there's a chance they're going to stop me from making it, or I'm not going to get an investor. So I always had this plan, mm -hmm. 
This is all the big, you, what you saw is the, the, the expensive version of making Clash. Yeah. But I had a version of making Clash in my house. Really? Building this car inside of my house and lighting uh, yeah. the lights, yeah. ex overexposure, so you mm -hmm. don't see anything outside. And it becomes a, 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 a like theater. So Amazing. I always had a plan to make it with no money. Mm. Amazing. So you have to be smart of, about those things. And I actually, me and my brother, at least we wrote th three films in one location. We had another film. Mm -hmm. It's called Induced Labor. About someone hijacking the American embassy in Egypt because his wife is nine months pregnant and he tried so many times to go to the U.S. He doesn't like what's going on in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So he's going to make her have his kid today in the embassy so she, the kid becomes American. <laughs> so the whole film is a comedy wow. about someone hijacking the embassy so his wife has her kid inside the embassy. Yeah. So again, you can find ways. You can find a way in, in making a film in one location or two locations or a, an apartment. I saw this French film, I forgot what it's named, one of my favorite films. The whole film is in the apartment and it feels, it doesn't feel like a gimmick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's about the domestic problem, a husband and a wife that are getting divorced and they're fighting over the apartment. So the whole film is about in the apartment and none of them want to leave it because none of them want to leave it. So. There is the gimmick. It's not a gimmick because it's, you feel like it's dramatically working. Same thing with Clash. You feel like it's a metaphor of Egyptians inside the car. So you, uh, it's fine. We're not getting outside the car for a reason. So you have to be smart and make something meaningful. Make something that affects people and then send it around. If no one took it, put it, put it on YouTube. People are going to... I hired people from uh, short films. I hired people from YouTube. Wow. I, so... Uh, uh, there's so many ways to make it these days. Um, just use the camera and start making mistakes and, and, and getting feedback from the people that, that, that are around you telling you, okay, which part did you excel and which part was awful until you, you make it. That's very motivational. Thanks a lot. Thank you, brother. And I, while our next person is coming up, I just want to remind y'all, it is my job to help you get your film in, films into festivals. <laughs> and we have a whole plan. We have people super successful right now. I'm so sure. you've got support here. I'm sure. Um, one of our super successful people is sitting right next <laughs> to me, by the way. Hi. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Mish. I'm from Russia. I'm a filmmaking student here in, in Naifa. First of all, thank you for wonderful viewing experience of The Clash last week. Thank um, you. I love that film so much. Uh, it's so close to my heart. Yes. And uh, most of the people here, I, I want to ask you a question to, as a, to a screenwriter. Yeah. Uh, most of the people sitting here are getting their way into writing their own scripts. And since we're in school, we're told how to do it. Like, maybe it's a good idea to have a strong, clear, goal-oriented protagonist and an optical and stuff like that. But then they say, you know, you might not necessarily need that. Look at these movies and these movies and yeah. they're all different. And Clash is so like, not like a clear, goal-oriented protagonist with an obstacle and stuff like that. Are there any principles or structures or strategies that stick with you that you use today that you find great value in while you're screenwriting process? Excellent question. I'm dying to hear this answer. <laughs> First of all, you need to learn the rules. I remember I was teaching a class and someone told me, you know what, I have to leave. Why? Because I, I don't want to know the rules. I, I need to be like my brain has to be ver a version or whatever. I told him that's wrong. You need to understand the rules in order to break them, to understand what's breaking the rules. Um, I, I understood the rules and I watched the films that break the rules. In my mind, eventually I found my own voice and my own way and, and how to make my own rules. Uh, um, I, oh, there's some stuff that I, there's no compromise in them for me. Like there's something called first act for me. Mm -hmm. And it starts a journey. I get intru introduced to the characters. Um, now that we're embarked on a journey and there's a, an end mm -hmm. where the character is going to learn something. And by the way, this is in Clash. A hundred percent. Clash, mm -hmm. you get introduced to all the characters. Every one of, one of them has a journey. And guess what? At the end of the story, every single one of them changed. The person yeah. who, uh, the, uh, um, who um, the, even the, the, the two friends who didn't know each other at the end of the story, they knew each other. The person who was with the Muslim Brotherhood became a, a, a different person. The Muslim, the person who was with the government became, uh, uh, changed his mind. And all of them were screaming at the end, because at the beginning of the story, all of them are divided. 
Right. And at the end of the story, every one of them is just like trying to stop the door. So that it's a moment of change. Everyone changed. What happens in the middle, I don't actually say this is the midpoint. I, that's my way. But I, I, I do this. A, uh, a cool moment, a moment of no, uh, expo uh, exposition that I know the characters a little bit, and then something happens. Mm -hmm. A moment uh, of exposition, and then something happens. And you, I just see the graph in my head, things are escalating until, mm -hmm. uh, until the end uh, uh, when I have the, so I have the first act and the last act, and what happens in the middle is just like going up and down, go, going up and down. I get to it naturally, but if you saw it, it's probably the rules. By the way, the rules of screenwriting, seven years ago, there was nothing called the rules of screenwriting. They just gathered, and you taught us this, they gathered what's common in the good screenplays. You know what I mean? It was a natural thing, and then they gathered, okay, what's common in the, the, the good screenplays? This is what's common. So let's create the rules. There was no, nothing called rules. So for me, I absolutely follow the rules in the first act absolutely follow the rules in the uh, third act. Mm -hmm. The middle act, I follow them, but from my old brain, from my, from na my natural instinct of just like creating uh, 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 obstacles and, and stuff that is pu pushing the story forward every like five minutes. Mm -hmm. You're never gonna see a movie of mine that is not fast. That is, and everyone struggles in the second act of being a bit boring or not finding something to do. But that's what I do, just like going up and down, going up and down, going up and down. Mm -hmm. You know Thank what? You. Um, thank you for asking that question, and it is such a gift, your answer, because often I think very successful filmmakers will act like they just magically know how to structure a story. No. <laughs> and, and I was watching Clash with the group the other day, and I was amazed. I was like, the narrative shifts, the point of view shifts from character to character. This is marathon running, writing right mm -hmm. here, right? Like, this is not something you want to start out with. You want to run a 5K <laughs> with your first feature or your first short and then graduate to I'm, the I'm, marathon. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm proud of Clash, but um, I remember one of the people that came to us, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Haggis at the time, before he had the problem, but Paul Haggis, uh, uh, Paul Haggis did uh, Clash. The He did another version of Clash. Uh, uh, um, crash, 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 yes. And whether you like the film, it won the Oscar, people hate it these days, but at the time, it was a very, uh, it was a huge success, but mm -hmm. he came and he said, he didn't know if this film was gonna be good or bad. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because it's such a, um, uh, 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 it's not made in the, stru the normal structure yeah. way. In, in Clash, I tried to do it, but it was a challenge, and every day I didn't know if I'm doing it right mm -hmm. or wrong. But, um, but I'm going back to our, our answer, the main thing that I learned from here was, was structure. Mm -hmm. And the main thing that I went back home with is structure. That's sunny. <laughs> <laughs> no, and you and Bennett. No, I remember yeah. every, all of us. It's, um, structure is very important. Can you break structure? Absolutely, but not in every film, unless this is your style. If it's your style, it's, it's absolutely fine. But um, I found it, again, don't think that the rules were created and then storytelling was created. No, they actually got the idea of rules because they got what's common in successful films. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very important to know in the mindset because a lot of people, I have to rebel against uh, the system or the, the, the structure, but sometimes you have to know that the structure is just like the normal way Socrates uh, 5,000 years ago was mm -hmm. telling a story. It's just the normal way. Thank you. Hi, Hello. thank you so much uh, for coming today. Thank My name you. is Sam uh, from Canada. And, and actually like you, um, I find more love in screenwriting, but because I love the story so much, I can't help but want to direct them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and my, funny enough, my question also is actually about uh, structure, but in more of a smaller sense. Um, when I watched both Clash and Moon Knight, but I watched Moon Knight before I got to Clash, I was, I mean, the the pilot of Moon Knight for me was extremely, extremely impressive. I love and that pilot. The <laughs> pilot is so good, man, for real. And um, what impressed me the most about it, I think, was the suspense, um, because there were scenes where you know, you know that Moon Knight, you know, you know that Oscar Isaac's character just did something, there's blood on his hands, um, yet 
we're not necessarily introduced to it fully until the very end and that beautiful scene at the very end. And I'm interested in, you know, also in Clash, when there's just these small scenes that happen, um, how do you see structure kind of in a smaller sense um, in terms of, you know, going from beginning, middle and end, but in within one scene and, and leaving just a bit so that, you know, there's a bit of a cliffhanger to the next scene, if you know what I mean. That's a very, another very important question. I, was, I always tell people, I always sit with people, other writers, and they come up with unbelievable stories. And I always feel, okay, I'm so small, they're so good, and I'm not. <laughs> and then my screenplay ends up better than them. And I sometimes ask myself why, and I always, uh, uh, I always tell, uh, my, my analogy is, you have to deal with a, with a screenplay as a building. It's not uh, the, 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 the idea of it. Every scene is a brick in that building, is a stone. And every stone needs to be dealt with as if this, because of that stone, this building is gonna stand or not. So every time I'm writing a, uh, a scene, I always, because I write with my brother and my sister, I write with other people, I write with my wife, never write the first thing that comes to your mind. Every scene, sometimes you know that scene, never. Every single scene needs to be treated like a film. There's a beginning, a middle, and end to the scene. Mm -hmm. The beginning, sometimes it's visually, okay, I'm gonna start the scene with me holding this and visually ending it with something or dramatically ending it with something or v dramatically starting it with something. But there is always, yeah. how the hell am I gonna enter the scene and how the hell am I gonna exit the scene? Sometimes people just like, I feel like, okay, the first thing that comes to mind, okay, I'm just like, I'm jumping between scenes because I wanna reach like something. No, 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 no. How are you gonna do that scene? And sometimes the best scene is, like one of my scenes that I never forget, there was a film called Closer. Maybe you don't know it, but it's um, it's a great film based on a play. One of my favorite scenes. Clive Owen. Yes. And um, Julia uh, Julia Roberts. Exactly. Yes. Natalie Portman. Natalie, Natalie Portman. Portman. The, the scene that she leaves her the, her love interest. The scene starts with him being the most romantic uh, partner, getting her a flower. Mm -hmm. So the scene starts with the 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 impossible you would never imagine that this scene would end up with her leaving him and that's what i'm telling you you know that this is the scene that they're going to leave each other but maybe started with the most outrageous thing that ever going to happen so when you start the scene it's the opposite of the end of the scene you know what i mean so that's that was that that's i always that scene always fascinates me because i know the writer knew no. that this scene is going to end with the two of them uh, leaving each other so how the hell start here that's that makes it 10 times harder so always deal with the scene as, as, as its own structure. Every single scene is something important that you need to think, how, how am I gonna start visually or dramatically and end visually and dramatically? Perfect, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you for your question. Hello, Mohammed. Hello. My name is Trey Scoggins. Um, first, I just wanna say congratulations on your achievements and it's an honor to have you here talking to us, sharing your thank experience. You. Um, <clears throat> As a filmmaker and director myself, um, we all know here that it's very hard to make a movie um, at many different levels. Now, my question to you at your level, what was your, your greatest challenge or obstacle that you had to overcome into making uh, Moon Knight or Clash? Um, every film had its own uh, uh, different fight. The first film I ever made to convince people that I'm not just a successful writer, I'm a good director, that was a challenge. Hmm. And then I have, I'm, I'm the hardest person on myself. So I waited, even though my film was a success, five years and a half for my next film. And that's very taxing. Like it's, it's hard on my family, it's hard on me financially, but I just like have those high standards. I need to make something better than the, my previous film. Mm. And thank God it paid off. And that film, I was telling everyone we're, while we're making it, we're gonna go to Cannes. And we're gonna do something about Clash. Yeah. There is a difference between being cocky and being confident, and you have to be in the middle. Uh, you have to be in the middle, you have to have your own confidence, not cockiness, but confidence, uh -huh. but, because a lot of people are, I see a lot of artists that are completely, they have no uh, uh, trust in themselves. Mm -hmm. They feel, no, we're not gonna make it, there's so many challenges, and they don't believe in their own voices. I always believe there's nothing that there is different between me and a, no and a person who's completely a failure, and there's nothing different between me and Steven Spielberg. The only difference is this guy worked on himself. 
We all have like this 10% uh, talent. Some people are touched by God. That's another something. <laughs> uh, and by the way, th these are things that I, 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 these are advices that I got from people who came here 15 years ago and I never forgot. Joel Schumacher. Yep, yep. Came here and said something I never forgot. He was a stylist. It's, this, it's the guy who made Batman. He's a, he, was, he died two years ago, but he was a very famous director. He was a stylist on one of uh, uh, Woody Allen's movies, and he told him, I want to be a director. And Woody Allen told him, I want to tell you something. There's only five, six people in Hollywood that are touched by gods. The rest are just like hard workers. At least you can be a hard worker. If you want to do it, you can do it. <laughs> and Joel Schumacher was sitting here and telling us, all my success, and I'm not touched by gods, I'm just a hard worker. A hard worker. <laughs> uh, so I never forgot that. Yeah. And I'm, and I believe that each of you, I'm sure some, some of you are like more brilliant than others, but you can always compensate with hard work. You can always uh, be a hard worker. You can always work more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and whether I can evaluate myself, whether I'm touched by gods or not, but I'm sure that I'm a very hard worker and I always elevate yeah. myself by doing that. Um, so uh, uh, Clash, Karo uh, uh, had a problem. Clash. I was fighting for m multiple reasons. One of them, I knew that the government is going to be uh, against that film. It's going to destroy my life in Egypt. Um, but I really believed in it. Mm -hmm. And again, I thank God my wife is, is, was believing in this because we paid a, a big price and we had to leave the country afterwards. And ironically, because of my style, we don't have a lot of money. Uh, we had to leave and just like start from scratch, living in Michigan in a very tiny house and everything. And ironically, I got offered a month after Clash uh, was in Cannes, uh, a film by Tom Hanks. He wrote it, Greyhound. So it was, okay, this is my lifeline. I, I can, wow. everything's perfect. And I read the script and I couldn't connect to it. I couldn't bring myself, it's, it's, I, I really don't think I'm a professional uh, uh, director, meaning I cannot direct something that I don't like or I don't connect mm -hmm. to. So it was the hardest decision of my life, and I said no. Um, and it was it was like a scary thing. It was a big scary thing for me because and uh, it, it, life is not easy. I didn't say no, and I didn't get a job the next day. It took four years. Mm. So and every day in those four years, when you're hot, when you come out of Cannes, you're hot. When you come out of uh, Moon Knight as a as a as a successful project, but then things fade. And all of a sudden, the next year, after writing my own screenplay, no one wants to read it, not even Tom Hanks. So I kept, my biggest fear was, okay, uh, am I going to write, uh, is it going to be written on my tombstone that I said no to Tom Hanks or what's going to happen? <laughs> uh, and I couldn't even reach him anymore. I couldn't even like send him my own movies. The script that I, but uh, you were, I worked on my, every, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my movies and I kept pushing, pushing, pushing until Moon Knight showed out, out of nowhere. And I applied just like a lot of people and I got the job. But I'm, what my, my, my point is, believe in yourself, but be willing to pay the taxes if you can. Uh, in my mind, I was thinking if I did a bad Tom Hanks movie, it's going to be the end of me. Okay, I'm going to have some money, some, some exposure, but it could be the end of me. And I knew that I'm not going to enjoy the process. I'm not going to be the best person to do it. In Moon Knight, and that's why I was saying mm -hmm. to be confident or not, when I read Tom Hanks, uh, the, the Greyhound, I knew I'm the worst person to do that job. When I read Moon Knight, with absolute confidence, once I finished the, 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 uh, the presentation, I yeah. told Sarah, we're, not gonna, we're gonna get this job or there is something wrong with the world. I knew. <laughs> so that's what I'm telling you, again, you have to be in the middle. Yeah. Know that this is not for me, but when you find something that is for you, when you, when you write your own script that you know that no one else in the world can tell the story better than you, be confident mm -hmm. and, and control the room. Know that you can do it. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that balance. But every project, I want to tell you something unfortunate. I just came from Moon Knight, right? I'm struggling today. Not that I don't have offers. I have tons of offers. But to find the next project that is going to be better than Moon Knight in my brain, I'm struggling. And in my mind, mm -hmm. in my mind, again, it's, it's in comparison. I get big things for you or big things for me five, uh, a year ago or two years ago but for me right now I'm not I'm not content and I want something bigger and I'm fighting with my agents I want more I don't like what I'm having and I'm stressed 
So every project for the rest of your life, that's the kind of uh, 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 work that you just signed up to. Even if you are, think of the most successful person in the world. Uh, Damien Chazelle did Whiplash. Believe me, he's under a lot of stress that, okay, my, I just made a TV show that no one saw. Then probably, am I done? Is it, um, uh, am I in fashion or not? This is the way it is. So you are as big as your last project. And if you didn't do something, okay, did, did people forget about me? And actually they do for a while. So um, my point is, you're gonna fight every single project and that's the way this, this job is. Okay, thank you. As our next person is coming up, I wanna say something about the touched by gods versus hard workers. Yeah. Because I see that with our students and I see that with our alumni and with films, it's like, the people who are working hard to get their films out to festivals are the ones that I think are going to be able to really move their careers forward. Um, and then sometimes I'll see an amazing film, but the filmmaker doesn't really want to work on that part of the process. Why? why? I, I think maybe they're intimidated, intimidated or it's boring. It's not as exciting as being on set, sitting and studying festival descriptions and submitting to festivals. I wish, I wish that there was someone like you, uh, for me, that that was such a great you thing. You heard that, you heard that, y'all. No, <laughs> by the way, because I actually did that on my own, I actually saw Sarah, Sarah, my wife, was, was mostly the one who's doing that. In uh -huh. our, everyone in Egypt and in the Arab world wants to know how I'm doing it, because it's going to festivals, it's, not, it's something hard to decipher. So if someone is helping you, Very please. hard to decipher. Yeah. Yeah, so please, yeah, definitely, yeah. It's, it's for your own benefit. And never get intimidated. Our job, I think part of it is sharing our work with the world and it's fine to be, guys, most of the people who did great jobs, did shitty jobs at the beginning, it's part of the, the project. I never wrote a screenplay that was good at the beginning. It was meh, a May script, but I never shoot a script until people tell me this is brilliant whether it is or not, but I'm just like, you have to reach that stage. So it starts with that, and you have to accept that. And it's hard, and every time there's someone giving me notes, I want to kill them. But I, I still keep those people who tell me that, uh, the, give me the harsh notes on my script, because they are the people who make that script better. Hi, Mohammed. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is uh, Timofey. Uh, I'm from Russia. Uh, uh, I'm on the filmmaking program. Uh, and last week, I watched your film Clash, and I was amazed by it. Thank you. Amazed by how truthful and brave it is. And it really touched me because uh, for me, it resembles the situation in my home country. And I really feel the experience of uh, those people that you show. And um, what was the most important for me in your film is that I felt like you didn't uh, particularly take uh, one side or voted for some side, but rather, uh, it was about uh, human and uh, human beings in all this horrible situation, which really inspired me. And uh, my question is, uh, what was the reception of the movie in Egypt? Uh, did, did you see people get influenced by such humanistic idea? W what was it like for them? It was one of the hardest uh, experiences of, uh, of my life. Everyone around the world loved Clash and everyone saw it very to, uh, for what it is. It's a human story trying to bring people together. But just imagine in a different world you're making a film about World War II and you're humanizing the Germans and the, the English or the Americans at the same time. Mm. Both sides hated, in, in Egypt, both sides hated me humanizing the other because the fight was mm. on the streets. So hum the Muslim Brotherhood or the people who hated the government, when I humanized the police, to them, you're siding with the police. Mm -hmm. And for the police or the government, I humanized the Muslim Brotherhood or the people from the revolution, you're humanizing the, the, the killers or whatever. That doesn't mean that everyone saw it this way, but it was attacked from both sides. There was a tsunami on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was attacked, I stayed for a month on my couch. It was the harshest time in my life. Uh, it, it was very harsh, very, very harsh beyond what I expected. I knew that some people are going to do it like that. Would I, would I have done it uh, again? Yes, because I would have wanted to do a film during World War II telling people don't kill each other. 
rather than doing it afterwards and telling, you know what, now you know uh, killing each other is bad. I'm sure it affected people because a lot of people loved it. Um, but the angry people were more vocal on, on Twitter right. and, or on social media. But um, I'm, so, I'm sure it affected people uh, and, and a lot of people got affected by it and that's the most important thing. And I'm proud that I made it in the right time even though it was harsh on me as a, as a filmmaker. Uh, but it was uh, very harsh. Like I was in Cannes and the Egyptian national TV had this 10 minute piece on me like I'm a, I'm a terrorist in a way. My, my parents told me don't go back home. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was very harsh, it was very harsh. But, um, but thank God, I'm still, I was a semi-celebrity so I knew that they're not gonna attack me. But there's this, they killed the film. So the film got a very bad release the distributor backed out of distribution like a, a, a week before the distribution. It was very harsh. Um, but because of those things, I left Egypt. And because of those things, my life changed. And because of those things, so I, I don't regret anything. And thank God, right now, after Moon Knight, uh, Egyptians love me. And even the government now treat me differently. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm, I'm fine. I, I think I, I had my fights. I was feeling like Clash is the last thing I'm gonna do for the Egyptian revolution. I feel like now I didn't give up. And then I'm gonna focus on making films because uh, at the end I spent three years being just an activist. And no matter how loud and important I am as an activist, it has no effect compared to a film. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if your activism is gonna stop you from making movies, I think that's the wrong decision. And that's what I learned. I'm happy and, and thankful for the experience that I got and it's made me made clash, but I would never make anything in the world stop me from making movies again. Thank you so much. You're very inspiring. Thank you. Um, before we move to the next question, I wanted to ask how you deal with the black backlash. I sit on a couch and cry. <laughs> I, I, I try to reason with it, but sometimes uh, <laughs> you, you can't. Yeah. And, and for, ironically, I think Life is like a, that's, that's, sometimes that's what I, what I really believe in God. Because I studied screen play, screenwriting and what happens in, what's happening in my life is so written like a screenplay that I just like, okay, that's, that's not a coincidence. Like I have a character flaw, for example. I have a character flaw. I care so much about people's opinion of me. I care so much. I, I, I want to be loved so much. I don't know why, even though like I had a, a I, I, I didn't have any traumatizing uh, 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 experiences when I was a kid or anything, but I love people so much and I want everyone to love me. It, it's too idealistic and it's too naive. So ironically, that's my character flaw and that's what I get tested every single time. Mm. I am the most guy that ever had backlashes in, in the Middle East. Every film, the last film, Amira, that I made. Yeah. Yes. Death threats. Uh, 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 I got demonized in the Middle East. You don't know how. Even though I just like, I made this film out of absolute love. No hate whatsoever. I got demonized. It was crazy. And it's just like sometimes, what the hell is happening? Is, are they watching the same movie that I just made? Um, but I'm telling you. Didn't you tell me one of your actresses was getting death threats? Yes, and she was, she's until yes. today, a year later, she's walking with the police security and some of the actors and the producer left the country, left mm. Palestine. But, um, but I, I, every single, and, and that's not because I'm a provocative person. It's just like, if you wanna change that part of the world, you have to move stones. And every time you move something, you're, you're changing the status quo and, 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 and status quo. It's just like you're, you're, you're upsetting a lot of people. Um, People do not like truth. But I want to tell you something. Again, even in with Cairo 678, mm -hmm. which was about sexual harassment in Egypt, the moment the trailer went out 12 years ago, people accused me of exaggerating, making it for uh, the West or whatever. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now, 12 years later, and Cairo 678 is one of the mm -hmm. things that happened. Laws has changed. Everyone acknowledges this is a problem. Like the reaction right now has changed. And I think Cairo 678 was one of the reasons that we started the conversation. Mm -hmm. The film was, uh, like I remember they wanted to show it in the UN. The only person that <laughs> disagreed was the Egyptian delegate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, yeah. this is part of the process and sometimes yeah. being uh, 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 attacked means that you're on the right track. Not, never, never make a film because you want to be a provocative person. But, uh, 
Again, going back to my character flaw, I am stronger right now. <laughs> but it's so funny. Your character flaw is what happens. It's what your weakness, that's what you get tested in. Hello. Hi, Mohammed. Uh, thank you, Cricket, for organizing this. Uh, my name is Shaza Muharram. I'm an Egyptian actor and filmmaker. And my question is about Cairo 678. Uh, I remember when I watched this film for the first time in cinemas, and I was, it's not an exaggeration. It is what happens to Egyptian women. And I was so impressed and so surprised to see that a man, a writer, was able to tell the story from a female perspective in a way that is very authentic and true. And I was wondering, how did you do that? Uh, uh, first of all, thank you, Shaza, for, for that question. Uh, she looks very Egyptian, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, uh, the best thing about this job is, and I hope the whole culture, which I am for, by the way, I'm, I'm not against woke culture, but I hope it doesn't take us from us, is that you can experience something that you that is not yours, mm -hmm. that you can be someone else and go to another experience. So I remember a, ver a, a, a filmmaker telling, telling me, you're not gonna be able to make a film about sexual harassment because you're not a woman. So I, I found that as a challenge Mm -hmm. How the hell am I supposed to immerse myself into the uh, a female experience in, in Cairo until I, I really uh, 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 become, a, not become a woman, but think like a woman and try to express how women feel. And that's what I, what I tried to do for two years. Just like, by the way, 2009, the problem is with sexual harassment and, and it's a big stigma in Egypt. So 2009, Egyptian men who are actually even feminist didn't know that it's that bad. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that my sister is living through this or my fiance or right. my mother. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So it was just like opening a Pandora's box, talking to women, exposing mm -hmm. themselves to me and telling me the stories. And uh, I, 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 feel, I feel that I'm a sensitive person. And part of our job is trying to identify with, with people. And I tried my best to, to, to live that experience in my mind and my heart. Mm -hmm. And it changed me as a man. I, I absolutely um, n never see women the same way after making six, seven, eight. I really, truly understood women uh, much more. And I, this is exactly what happened to me when I did the Palestinian film. I really understood where they're coming from. I want to make an American film or whatever, like making Moon Knight or the people with DID. I definitely... I would never say that I, you fully get the, the full experience because definitely someone who had the full mm -hmm. experience is going to express it better than you. But uh, I, I, it's our only chance. As filmmakers, definitely even better than spectators. But as a spectator, you have one hour and a half to close your eyes and become someone. It's just like being John Malkovich, being inside someone's head mm -hmm. is a film. Making it... Making a film for two years, it's definitely a better experience of trying your best to get out of your body, out of body experience and become someone else. Um, if you are a filmmaker, it, you should, and I always fight like with some writers of mine, it's like if you're fighting, uh, we're driving and they go, go mad. Like my brother, for example, he gets <laughs> mad. And I tell him, you're not, you're n you still have some, somewhere to go to be a better screenwriter. Because I always tell myself, okay, maybe he had a bad day, maybe he, had fight with, he fought with his mom, maybe, maybe, there's so many maybes, I try to ident identify with him, and I never had a rage, uh, a rage road, ever, because I always can identify with someone, I, I, even though I am someone who can be pushed easily, uh -huh. but because of that understanding, it's rare when you find me angry, rare, I always put myself in someone else's shoes, try to think where they're coming from, yeah. and what if I knew them in a different situation. But I'm um, going back to your uh, question. Hmm. That's a great feeling that you only feel when you're making a film. Um, and I hope you can all experience it. To write about something you know is great, but n writing about something you haven't experienced, it, it evolves you as a human being. And I think this, uh, Cairo 678, I'm always proud of uh, that uh, experience of making it. And every other film, when I was making Clash, the hardest thing was, I have an opinion. Mm -hmm. There's people in the car that represents me, mm -hmm. but I need to be true to the other people that I actually hate their opinions. I, I don't like the, you, to use the word hate, because if you hate someone, you're not gonna be able to, to, to actually 
fully express them. But I hate their experiences. I hate their opinions. I hate what they're doing. So it was very harsh for me and very hard for me to try to, for example, understand why a police officer becomes so brutal and kills someone. In, mm -hmm. in, and in a matter of minutes, try to express that. And at the same time, someone from the Muslim Brotherhood or someone actually who's inclined to be a, a, a terrorist, which is absolutely against my beliefs, mm -hmm. but try to experience them and understand where they're coming from. And I feel someone would see, would see that and tell you, are you sympathizing with that or that? Mm -hmm. But actually, if you don't understand people, you're never going to be able to express them and you're never going to be able to ex uh, understand them. If you really, the person that you're disagreeing with in the American politics today, you're just like, okay, they're just like Trump supporters or whatever, and you're just seeing them like that and not understand them, you're never going to change them. Right. You're never, never going to be, you're never going to be able to have a conversation with them. And I always, by the way, fall into that trap of, of being angry and, and mm -hmm. seeing them, not anyone that I disagree with, I'm not saying I'm a saint, but I'm just reminding myself, this is what I, if one day you made a film about someone who's opposing you in politics, and really try to understood them. I'm not saying you're going to change your mind, but you're going to discuss. When you have a discussion, you're going to be more sympathetic. Thank you, Shaza. Thank, Thank you. Can I get a sense of how many more questions we have back there? Can you raise your hand if you have a question? I'm going to answer faster. I'm going to, answer, right. I'm going to answer everyone. Okay. So we're the person at the very back. Hello, is our last, wait, we have another, pro okay, you're our last question. I'm going to answer very fast, I promise. <laughs> it's All a yes right. and no question. <laughs> uh, hi, my, uh, my name is David, I'm a screenwriting alumni. My question is quicker, I guess, but, uh, but <laughs> basically uh, Moon Knight has a lot of stories to it, right? So there's decades of story to it and I was wondering, what do you do when you have too much story? How did you know what to focus in uh, on, like, which, I don't know, comic arc to adapt, that sort mm -hmm. of stuff? Was the uh, script already ready? Uh, did you have to choose between all the mythology? How was that process? Um, sometimes Marvel work in, in, in two different ways. Sometimes, if you're the guy who's going to write the project, so you get involved from the beginning. But if there's like a writer, especially when, on TV, there's a writer. So we had Jeremy Slater, and I think he did what you were asking for. It's very hard to screen all those uh, 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 stories and then have a, a laser focus on one thing. And I think that was part of his pitch from the beginning. Jeremy was brilliant in taking the secondary character, Stephen, and starting with him. That's mm -hmm. a brilliant idea. Yeah. Just imagine, I think that's a, that's a brilliant idea by itself. Imagine that the secondary character discovers that he's a secondary character later on. It's a brilliant idea. That's Jeremy's idea. Uh, but when I was telling you at the beginning, you come and part of the uh, pitch is how are you going to evolve the story? Part of like evolving the story that I was pitching when I was, me and Sarah, when I was pitching for the story was just like um, we had um, Mark and Layla in love, but there was no connection to Stephen. So we p pitched this idea, what if we created a love triangle between a person and himself? We never saw that ever. So that, that got included. The villain, the villain was pitched as a, 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 an evil Indiana Jones. He was just like after the, the relics and stuff like that. So we created the cult leader and stuff like that. And, mm. and, and those things came from there. But the, I, the, the focus on the story itself came from the writers on Marvel. I came a, a, a year later, evolved the story. What would I, my most contribution, me and Sarah, was evolving the drama. Like even in episode one, which was perfectly written by Jeremy, I think we added some stuff that made you just like sympathize with the character more. Like um, the idea that he was dating a girl that wasn't there. And then he discovered that he missed the date because of what's going on, what mm -hmm. happened in his life. And the diner scene, which is my favorite scene, and the scene that you really feel for him, that he's talking to her and he discovers that, that, she, that he missed that moment. And you yeah. discover that, oh my God, the guy can't even have a, a, a normal date. That's why his life is effed up. Because he can't have a normal life. So you, 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 those small things, uh, we added in episode five, um, the drama that people loved about the background was something that, uh, we helped add me and Sarah but uh, as I told you the main direction of the story was there because of Jeremy Slater and his team his great team and 
We had great writers, even after the, the, the draft that we wrote, unbelievable writers uh, helping uh, incorporate everything that everyone was adding. Um, but it's a, it's a long process. I would say the writing ends the last day of editing. <laughs> the last day of editing. Because you always have uh, the, 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 when you're going to reshoot, it means you can add anything you want. Mm -hmm. Kill characters, add stuff, add a storyline, do whatever you want. So if the story is not working, anything can be added. So writers jump in and sometimes rewrite the whole thing from the beginning. Crazy. Thanks. No problem. Thank you. I love the scene um, when Stephen tells Layla she looks beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, for him, it's, it's a new thing. And he loves her while the other guy is getting a divorce and leaving her. It's, yeah. it's such a confusing thing. I always thought this idea by itself could be a film. Mm -hmm. Someone <laughs> having a, a, a love triangle between you and yourself. Yeah. And yeah. one person wants to leave and one person wants to stay. Crazy. Yeah. Hi. Hi, my name is Margot. I'm from France. I'm an actress and a writer. And it's been really inspiring to hear you talk about how at first you didn't want to do Egyptian movie. You really wanted to do American movies because I was feeling the same. But the more I grow up and watch movies, the more I find things interesting in my own country and culture. And it was really inspiring. Um, I'm a huge Marvel fan and I watched every show's like multiple times and I really saw something different in Moon Knight and it was so enjoyable it really stood out so my question is would you be interested to well you're gonna do season two but like do bigger projects for Marvel like movies if they ask you would you like Ab that absolutely I want to tell you that I am definitely I wish I can be Denis Villeneuve he makes mm -hmm. those huge movies into mm -hmm. intimate uh, stories Mm -hmm. So it's not about, I, I remember Oscar Isaac, when he called me the first time, they called him about the project and he didn't want to do it because he just came from huge movies and he just like was fed up with it. And I try to convince him that making a huge spectacle, make, making a huge film doesn't mean that we're not going to tell an intimate story. So my wish is to make big films, but still keep those intimate stories in, in, mm -hmm. in those films. And that balance is not easy. But uh, it's achievable, and, and Denis Villeneuve is proving it, and he's doing his thing, mm -hmm. and thank God it's working, um, and it's, it's succeeding financially, and it's succeeding. Mm -hmm. Dune is, was nominated for 10 uh, Academy Award movies, uh, Academy Awards, so huge. Um, so definitely I would say yes if, if there is a film. Making another TV show, at least I need a break for a year or something, because mm -hmm. a TV show means we weren't, we weren't making a TV show. We were making a six-hour film. Mm, yes. So all the crew is film crew. So it's hard to make six hours of film. You were trying to make it at the same quality. Mm -hmm. You were, I forgot who was asking about, uh, who was talking about episode one, but in every TV show in the world, mm -hmm. you would see that episode one, I'm not saying it has to be the best, but the effort in episode one is definitely better than the rest because it got the most uh, 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 time in preparation. It got the most time. We knew exactly that episode one is not gonna change except like a scene or two. Mm -hmm. So that's why episode one got every, when I was saying pre -vis, every scene got pre -vised. We knew exactly what we were doing. If you come to episode five, which was a huge success, people loved it because of the drama in it. But for me as a, as a filmmaker, I definitely wanted to take double the time to make every single scene even more. You wouldn't notice, but I would notice. In episode one, every single thing is impeccable when it comes to making it. Um, the way I shot it, the way every single thing. But that's what happens. And I was saying that to tell you that I want a movie, 120 minutes that I can focus on. <laughs> Give them the $160 million that I spend uh, in six hours, I spend them in two hours. Yeah. So you get more for your buck and you, the action sequence, you can make them even bigger. You, the, the graphics, you, you, you make them even bigger. So, and that's what the difference between a film and a, and a, and a TV show is you get more time for the minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank Best you. of luck. Hello.
Hello. How are you? Um, my name is Anthony. I'm from Namibia. I'm doing directing and screenwriting, my MA year. Um, I don't know if this question was asked because I ran from class, so I quickly came here. But as an African or your local stories, how do you bring your stories that you want to tell the rest of the world to an international audience? Like, because you still want to keep with telling original stories from your home and bring it for the rest of the people to see. Because Clash was the first time I watched it when uh, last week. And I was very impressed how you brought a story that no one else from the rest of the world would know about but can understand at the end of the day after watching this film and have a deeper understanding. Thank you. Um, we partially talked about it, but I'm going to tell you exactly. I, was, I, I started by actually completely being culturally defeated, didn't want to make anything about my culture. I went here to school and understood more than anything else that this, I need to talk about, this is, I need to uh, uh, make stories about what I know and about my culture. Moon Knight, I struggled with finding the right project for me in Hollywood for the past six years until I found Moon Knight and I felt, okay, this is something that I know about. This is, I can express that. It has this middle ground of there is a Western character and there's an Egyptian character and, 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 and I can tell about, uh, I can know, um, express the story better than anyone else. Right now, I'm in the middle of making Egyptian movies, but always my Egyptian movies, I'm trying to find the universal aspect of it, a universal theme. So when I made Clash, I, was, I knew that this could be a universal film. Everyone can re relate to uh, two sides hating each other. It doesn't really matter what's the politics behind it. And in the same time, right now, I'm, I'm developing more than one story that are about my part of the world. I started thinking about that even like after I, I thought about that before Moon Knight, but when I saw the impact in the Middle East and how people are so proud of that, um, and how there is a lack of, of showing my part of the world, even like the Egyptology, that old Egypt, like you don't see any film or any uh, um, TV show about old Egypt. So that's what I'm focused on right now. I'm trying to find the couple of projects that can appeal to the West, but about my culture, mm -hmm. and at the same time, Develop a project or two in the in, in Egypt that has universal story uh, uh, that can appeal to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not easy to find those kind of projects, but I'm focused on that. Um, trying to, in a way, at the end, I'm making films because I want to connect with the world. Uh, I'm making films in Egypt because I want to share it with the world, to share the experience. Movies are a bridge between cultures. At the end, when you see Clash, you feel okay. Uh, uh, I have. Living in America, I see that kind of struggle. I hate the other side of the aisle in, in, in politics. But eventually, I connect to those Egyptian people. The same thing would happen with Moon Knight. Okay, those people are not dif as different as, as me. Egyptians seeing Mark and Stephen's life, seeing the same thing. I can, I can be that person. So I want to connect with the world. I want to share and bridge gaps between cultures. This is, and, I, and, and I'm trying to do that as, as best, best as I can. And I encourage you. There's so many people here expressing themselves as Americans, and mm -hmm. the line is so long, but you have your own voice. I never heard about a story about Namibia. I'm sure you have your own voice. Mm -hmm. um, and even like the first film I wrote here, it's a complete American film and doesn't have any Egyptian characters, but it's about the Egyptian revolution at its core. You know what it was similar? Uh, the Egyptian director, uh, Sam Ismail, making his first debut project or not, uh, in TV here, Mr. Robot, mm -hmm. which is about the Egyptian revolution. Mm -hmm. So it's not, even though it doesn't have any Egyptian characters, mm -hmm. but it's about the Egyptian revolution. So maybe it doesn't have to be a Namibian character, but it should be about your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoy the day. So I think we have two more questions. Hi, Make them good, y'all. Make them good. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My Hello. name is Mansi. I'm from New Delhi. Uh, I'm currently studying screenwriting here. And uh, I quickly wanted to thank you for two things. One is for portraying Egypt outside of the Orientalist gaze. Thank you. And especially Leila, because I really enjoyed watching her break away from the submissive trope Absolutely. of like the, the submissive Egyptian woman. So thank you so much for that. And I know you call yourself a culture police of Egypt too. So, <laughs> so yeah. And secondly, thank you so much for presenting Tavare to us in popular culture, because there's no real representation of such Egyptian goddesses, especially Tavare. I was so... Um, I was so happy to see her uh, on screen, and um, I'm also writing uh, my my the the film that I'm focusing on is heavily influenced by Egyptian mythology. So it was really interesting to see that. Um, my question to you is that um, what were the challenges you faced while presenting your authentic voice inside a giant Marvel canon, inside the pre-written world of Marvel? 
Were there any challenges? Uh, first of all, uh, 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 we're lucky that we are in this time. Like five years ago, I pitched stuff. It wasn't like I pitched a story, for example. Uh, at the time, there was Narcos. It was like breaking the world. And I pitched Gaddafi, a crazier version of Narcos. And I sold it. And ironically, the po my partners pushed me to find an American writer for the project at the time. Hmm. And they insisted that's the only way it's going to get made. And when that American writer wrote it, definitely it felt like an American ri person mm -hmm. writing uh, 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 an Eastern story. And we sold it to Amazon and it got canceled right away. And in, inside of me, I was sad that it, this happened, but I just like, I was, okay, this makes more sense. It's not an authentic story and it, it feels like it. So things are changing right now. So I, I wanted to tell you that Marvel, when it came to anything Egyptian, that was my secret card. <laughs> that was just like, okay, this is Egyptian. They were absolutely okay. If this is this is uh, uh, this is what's appropriate for the culture, then we're gonna do it. They got me for that's one of the reasons I, I was there, and uh, they did it with utmost respect. And and they were anything Egyptian. I told them, and I was definitely the Egyptian police. Just imagine if I went to Guatemala or a place that I don't know that nuances of. Mm -hmm. I need someone to guide me and tell me, okay, this is different between uh, Guatemala and Salvador or whatever, like those small nuances. For us, for example, me and Isra or Shaza, the moment I see someone with a veil, I can tell you this woman is from Egypt or this woman is from Iran or this woman is from Syria. Mm -hmm. It's very hard for someone who doesn't understand the differences to tell you what's, what's what. And that happens even in the people who put their efforts. So it's not just about the story. Sometimes the story, the execution, the, the so many times we see a Saudi or a, a, an Egyptian or a Moroccan character speaking the dialect of, of the other country. And it's right. completely, I don't understand Moroccan dialect. Mm -hmm. This is how different it is. It's Arabic. Yeah. I don't understand it. So thank God Marvel was absolutely, when it comes to respecting the culture, there is, they were absolutely respectful. And even, not just me, we had uh, uh, an entity called Sila was uh, looking, reading every script and sometimes even watching the episodes and telling their comments about culture. Egyptian culture, Jewish culture, anything that is, uh, and I think it's, it would be the same for Miss Marvel or anything uh, uh, from any, any, any culture. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and, and definitely, yes, Layla, I, um, every movie of mine, I was, I was breaking that trope. Every movie of mine, Karo 678, Clash, and Amira, the strongest person in the film is a woman. Because actually, because our world is not, you can't, it's not easy to live in it as a woman, mm -hmm. women are stronger. My mom is so strong, my wife is so strong, you have to, it's not, I know it's a Western thing, Yes, the situation is perf isn't perfect for women in every aspect, but actually that makes women stronger. You know what I mean? It's not that it makes them weaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. That. We need more male screenwriters like you. So. Thank you. I'm I'm sure I'm sure one day I'm I'm, I'm gonna meet one of you, uh, 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 making their films and being in a bigger stage. All right, our last question of the day. Well, welcome to your last question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is CL. I'm an actress from China. And uh, I know you mentioned a lot about, about expressing your own voice. And me, as an actress, I have a very strong voice for um, in whatever I uh, act in. I like how I feel my connection with the character and how what is truthful for me. Um, that will uh, react to a certain um, situation. So I know that for director and actors, there's a love and hate situation <laughs> in coping uh, with what's going on, especially you're a screenwriter. So I'm sure you have a very specific image for maybe even specific to a point that which line that the uh, tear sh should fall that's great for aesthetic point of view, yeah. but what if the your actor feel that's not like something, like you have a conflict in um, a certain action, how would you cope with that? Uh, very, very smart question. Um, as a director, I I, I, I definitely, and as, as a screenwriter and as a director, definitely I see things in my head, but I, I don't think I ever settle. I'm one of those directors. I don't settle for what I have in my head. You have to have your own interpretation. It's mm. never alive without your own interpretation. Yeah. 
if your interpretation as an actress is absolutely different than mm -hmm. the flow of how I see the story, because I see that scene and what's seen behind it and, uh, and what's seen before it, in my, what I learned is you should give everyone the chance and have it. There's a difference between theater, the big difference between theater and film. Theater, you can evolve your, what you do every single day. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, the performance is going to be different because I felt something today and maybe there's something uh, 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 that I'm going to feel tomorrow or a thought. In film, it's different. There's a scene today, we have two hours to shoot it. Whatever we got, it's the only thing that we're going to get, get for the rest of our lives. Right. So I always think maybe, maybe what I'm feeling right now is wrong. So if you have something, please try it. I'll always give you a chance to try it. I get into a conflict with the actors who don't want to try what the director wants to say, <laughs> which some actors do. Some, some actors want to protect their way yeah. and tell me, no, 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 this is, this is uh, they don't want to do it. Yeah, because something phony you left on the tape is done forever. <laughs> it's yeah, forever. but you have to trust. I trusted your, and I'm, some, some actors think I'm tricking them. I'm just giving them what they want and I'm just going to throw it in the garbage. But no. A truthful person, a smart person, would take all the options and see the puzzle. Because when you have all the, the cards, you can play. You write the last version of the screenplay in the editing room. Mm. So I'm smart enough, and you should be smart enough, to give all the option and trust your director that he's going to... Uh, uh, and always, if you, have, if you see a director so keen in having this, just suggest can I just like do it one a different way and play with it in the editing room? Maybe you're gonna like it, maybe not. Sometimes it works. Sometimes in the editing room you're in a different mindset, mm -hmm. and sometimes what you just did and you surprised me with works with the the next scene or the previous scene or that mm -hmm. cut better than anything else. So what I would suggest for your own experience: never be rigid. Rigid. Never uh, be the actor who's just like I know what I'm doing. I'm protecting myself. I'm only gonna give him what I want. That's completely wrong. You're hurting the experience, um, and you're not trusting your director. Mm. You have to trust your director. Mm. That's maybe that's the worst experience I had with a, as, with an actor. It's not a fight or anything like that, but it's when someone doesn't want to give me what they what they want. Sometimes they do it in a polite way, which is I'm gonna try and they don't. <laughs> they try and and they don't give me. They don't really go to the length that I'm that I want to do. What you should do. Uh, lots of actors, once they with me. And I'm an actor director. Every film that I made, uh, I think people love the actor. Thank God. Uh, lots of them come to me after they see the end result, and they every single time they tell me it's way better than I expected me to be, because I know. Uh, and it doesn't mean that it's always my way. It's a mix of whatever we got on tape. Mm -hmm. I'm never. I never have have any prejudice towards what I got. I'm mm. you, you, you're going to be so stupid if you're just like, oh, this is my idea or this is... Never do that. You always have to be true to the project. My project is my daughter or my son. Mm. And I'm trying to do what's best for them. Mm. But a very smart question. I yeah. think that's a great way to end this. My project is my daughter or my son and I'm going to do the best for them. Exactly. Can we give Muhammad a round of applause? Thank you.